This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Today, in the final installment of our From the Archive series, Lewis Leakey. I ought to sp- should be speaking at this. Just about you, normal. I'll be speaking at this level because I don't want to strain my voice too much. Now, are you getting it as loud as you'd like to have it, I wonder? Lewis Seymour Bassett Leakey was a Kenyan paleoanthropologist who devoted his life to the study of human origins. He was born on August 7, 1903. That's 116 years ago today, if you're listening on the day this episode was released. Leakey was famous for his many fossil and archaeological discoveries. His work showed the world that our human journey began in Africa. He was also famous for inspiring others to explore the fascinating story of how we became human. His charisma was legendary, and his passion for science was contagious. He was a relentless promoter and popularizer of human evolution. He traveled the world giving lectures, making public appearances, and raising money for he and Mary's research and for the research of others. Louis Leakey worked alongside his wife and collaborator, Mary Leakey. Their discoveries include Zinge, now known as Paranthropus boisei, and Homo habilis, nicknamed Handyman. They found so many fossils and stone tools that they were known for having a special knack called Leakey's luck. I can't think of anyone who's had a bigger impact on a field of research as Lewis Leakey did. Beyond his own discoveries, his 20 books, and his more than 150 scientific papers, the whole Leakey family, including Mary, Richard, Philip, Jonathan, Meave, and Louise Leakey, have made varied and important contributions to human origins research. His legacy lives on in other ways, too. Leakey was a visionary and wide-ranging thinker. He thought there were some questions about humans that could only be answered by studying our closest cousins. So he found and mentored three women who he sent off to start studies of the great apes. The trimates, also known at the time as Leakey's angels, were Jane Goodall, who studies chimpanzees, Diane Fossey, who studied gorillas, and Barute Galdicus, who's still studying orangutans. These women opened new worlds of understanding, and they inspired many, many others to follow in their footsteps. Today, primatology is a rare field of science that has more women than men. And last, but by no means least, there's the Leakey Foundation, which was created by people who were inspired by his message, shaped by Louis Leakey himself, and set up with a mission to answer the biggest questions about how we became human. Lewis's passion for science, for helping others, and for sharing the amazing story of our origins lives on in the nonprofit that bears his name. So today, you'll hear Lewis Leakey share the story of his life and work in an interview commissioned by the Leakey Foundation and recorded in 1969. Within our lifetime, a dramatic shift has taken place in the knowledge of man's beginnings. Thirty years ago, it was generally believed that man's origins lay on the Asian continent. Now it is accepted that the more likely place is the African continent. The man responsible for this change is Dr. Louis S. B. Leakey, who, with his wife Mary and occasionally with his three sons, spent 30 years in the ancient lake beds of East Africa, literally unearthing the evidence that places man's beginnings on the African continent and sets his beginnings more than a million years earlier than was once supposed. Their work during the past three decades has resulted in enough remains to keep a regiment of analysts going for another 100 years. Lewis Seymour Bassett Leakey was born in Kenya. His parents were missionaries to the Kukuya tribesmen with whom he grew up. After uh, earning his degree from Cambridge University, he returned to Kenya with an archeological expedition and was thereafter to pursue a distinguished career in anthropology, or not only in anthropology, but as well in archaeology, paleontology, zoology, and anatomy. This eclecticism has caused some to refer to Dr. Leakey as the modern counterpart of the Renaissance's universal man. His writings reflect this universality. Uh, He's authored books ranging from popular reports on his own work, such as Adam's ancestors, to an authoritative grammar on the Kikuyu language. His most recent book is entitled Unveiling Man's Origins. Dr. Leakey, I want to go back to your own origins and particularly to how you came to be born in Kenya. Because as I recall, 
it was your mother and her three sisters who first came to East Africa at a time not uh, long after the famous uh, uh, Stanley Livingston episode, was it not? At a time when young ladies didn't go to East Africa. Uh, my mother and her three sisters were the first unmarried white women to go to East Africa. There had been a certain number of women who had been with their husbands, uh, like Mrs. Baker and others, but the, the first time that any unmarried white woman left the Victorian home and went out to Israel was my mother and her three sisters, mm -hmm. 1892. Mm -hmm. And your mother uh, insisted upon traveling across East Africa at a time when no one would permit her to do so. Well, she was told she mustn't try and walk to Uganda, so she said, I'm very much very sorry, I'm going. Mm -hmm. And she set off on foot with very few porters, and she walked from Mombasa right through to Uganda on her own. Did you know her? Oh, yes, very well. Very, very well. And this must have had a considerable influence. That is your mother as well as your aunt uh, and your father who came to East Africa as a missionary. Did he, he, came, he came later in 1901. A, much, a, a, a rather hearty lot of people, I should think. Very, very determined people, shall we say. <laughs> Real pioneers. Now, you were not the first white child born in no. Kenya but certainly among the earliest. I was neither number three or number four of the upcountry children born in the upcountry register. There were about 30 before that down the coast, I think. Mm -hmm. Upcountry being away from the coast. Away then. from the coast, mm -hmm. yes. What do you first recall of Kenya? What do I first recall of Kenya? Uh, it's hard to, hard to answer. I think probably going out for walks from the mission station uh, down to the river and crossing the river and up the other side, those days it seemed a very long way, and actually it's just a quarter of a mile or so. For the most part, your playmates were Kikuyu all children. Kikuyu, all Kikuyu, yes, all Kikuyu. Every now and then we go into Nairobi, where mother's sister, Aunt Sibi, was working with her husband, and then we spent a weekend, and I had cousins there, but that was very rare. It took a long time to get there. We had to walk. Mm -hmm. How long did it take? A whole day. Mm -hmm. Walk one day, stay there the next day, come back the next day. No, I understand that the Kikuyus uh, were a large part of your informal education. They very much so. Though you uh, obviously went to a, a school, or did your parents teach you? Uh, I never went to school until after World War I. Uh, I had an education from a school teacher who lived with us, Jordanus, if you like, taught me a little, and then left when the war, World War I broke out. And after that, Father gave us a limited amount of teaching, but he couldn't do much. I didn't really go to school until I was, uh, I was 16. And what did you learn? What did the Kikuyus teach you? Did Primarily, uh, observation, patience, uh, stoicism. Stoicism? Oh, yes. Never to show pain, never to, to, to acknowledge that you felt pain. Mm -hmm. uh, it was vital. I mean, you must never, never admit that something hurts you. And patience, 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 which is vital to my work. And observation, which is also vital to my work. Mm -hmm. In what Sm ways did they teach you observation? Uh, to notice those very smallest things. Here's a, you're, you're out going through a, a footpath, and there's a broken, a cobweb broken, and the spider's on this side of the path, on the footpath. That means that somebody, either a person or an animal, passed through there within a very short time, because otherwise the spider would join it up again. The spider's still on the web. And the web isn't joined up, then the, the breaking of that web was very, very recent. Little things like that. A bent leaf, uh, which an ordinary person would never notice at all, and it shows you straight away that somebody's passed there. Little tiny, tiny things, not, not footprints and the ordinary things that people think about in scouting or tracking. It's the tiny, tiny things that you have to observe that are vital. Vital to living, for that matter. In what ways are they vital to living? Because, to your work, it's quite no, clear. No, vital to living, because if you don't... Notice a thing like a broken cobweb, and you're down in the real bush, and there's a uh, wounded buffalo has gone through ahead of you, and you didn't spot that, you aren't on the way dirt. I see, vital to survival, then. Uh, yes, vital yes. to survival, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, same thing. And this sort of thing has stood you in good stead through these years, because you've lived a good uh, part of your I, life. I have lived all my life there, except at the university, and uh, all the time in, in, in the bush. Well, it's just perpetually observing, not all the time observing consciously. A very large part of the time you're observing subconsciously. You, you're suddenly aware there's something wrong, and you don't analyze it until afterwards. Then you realize what it was that, that gave you the clue. 
Writers have said of you that you sometimes think and sometimes dream in Kikuyu. Whether this is so or not, one, I suppose, would assume that Kikuyu is a, might be a primitive language. Why would one think or, or dream? Well, I grew up using three languages all the time, Kikuyu, French, and English. And Kikuyu is a far more explicit language, and therefore better for dreams than for thinking. Uh, you don't you have so many tenses in Kikuyu, you don't have to use adverbs. Kikuyu has 56 tenses in indicative mood. <laughs> and you never have to say, uh, uh, this morning or this afternoon or midday, your tense indicates exactly which part of the day you're talking about. I don't say, I did, I, this morning I got up at 5 o'clock, you used the right tense, and it shows that I got up at 5 o'clock is this morning, not this evening. The tense says so. So when you went to Cambridge, you were to major in French in Kikuyu. No, no, well, we don't use the word major, of course, but I took part one in French in Kikuyu, yes, and then part two in Anthropology and Archaeology. But there was some difficulty with Kikuyu. Uh, no, no difficulty, except that they wanted me to... I said I was going to do Kikuyu, and they said, you can't, and I said, why not? They said, it isn't a modern language. I said, it is. And they said, but... I said, well, it's spoken by more than half a million people, and you, you define a modern language as spoken by half a million people or more. So it's a modern language, I'm taking a quill. You can't. Uh, anyway, they finally decided I could, and then they couldn't find two examiners, so I trained one man to, make, to examine me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, many of my colleagues talk about having examined myself. I didn't. I trained my examiner. <laughs> I guess better. Yes. You... I understand we're interested in uh, ornithology at the time you went, uh, or as a young man, before you went to Cambridge. Not a young man. Up to the time I was 13, my basic interest was in birds. From about six or seven, I started learning to have a skin a bird, make a skin for study purposes, studying birds' eggs. I was going to be an ornithologist. I was going to do the birds of Africa. And then I read a book called Days Before History when I was not quite 13, and from that moment, I never went back. So from 13 onwards, I've been an archaeologist. What was the, the, the days before history is obviously about uh, prehistory. It's a, a, a book about, about the prehistory of England by a man called Hall. And that absolutely turned my whole life. Why? Because I was so fascinated with what he said about the early man in England. And that there was absolutely nothing about early man in Africa at all. So I decided that it's high time we knew more about early man in Africa. Did you uh, think I that, would do it. Did you think that... Uh, Early man was from Africa. At that well, he, he had he quoted in that book uh, that Darwin had said way back in 1875 that the origin of man would be found in Africa one day, and I believed it. And from then on, I looked to see whether Darwin was right, and he was right. Do you know why you believed it? Because I was a Kenya born, and I like to think it was true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At that at that age, my youth, I didn't think of it seriously. But if Darwin had said we would find man in Africa. And Darwin was a great man, and Africa was my home. I didn't see why we shouldn't prove it. I see. So uh, you left Cambridge before you finished as a result of an injury. And I left, I left Cambridge for one whole year because of an injury to my head, mm -hmm. playing rugby football. Mm -hmm. And you came back to Africa. I came back to Africa. That was the first. I, no, my, my first scientific work in Africa was 1923. Mm -hmm. And was this after... Cambridge then? No, that was during Cambridge. During Cambridge, during Cambridge yes. yes. And then I came back in my first big expedition, 1926, when I'd finished Cambridge. In 1923, you came then in as, a, as a student. Not as a student, no. But, but you were uh, out of school for I, a year. I, I was out of school, yes. but I came as the, what you call logistics man, for a big, big expedition from the British Museum. But you learned a good deal of the technique from the leader of that expedition. I, learned, I learned not the technique of, of archaeology, but the technique of preserving bones. He was, we were digging for dinosaurs, which is not my field at all. But the techniques of preserving fossils are the same. And this was an Amer a Canadian called Carter, and I learned from him magnificent things. He died on the expedition, I He think. died on the expedition, yes. Then in 1926, having graduated from Cambridge, you came back. Oh, on well, your, I, was this on your own expedition? Yes, I, uh, well, I'd finished Cambridge, and everybody said, well, you better go to Asia. Asia's the place for any man. And I said, no, I'm going to look my own country first. If there's nothing there, then I might go to Asia in a few years' time. Oh, it's the wrong place to go. However, I raised enough money to come back to East Africa, to my home. And from then on, things got better and better, and it never stopped. But how did it start? How did it start? Well, I first went to a site near Nakuro, 
And I, I had determined from the very, very beginning that I would work backwards in time. So I chose a site where I thought I'd get man maybe two or three thousand years ago, which I did. So you began to work back in time? I was, first of all, about two or three thousand years, then ten thousand years, then fifty thousand years, then a hundred thousand years, then a million years, then two million years, and now I'm back at twenty million. Mm -hmm. Present moment, I'm looking for man at twenty million. Or not man, but man's, man's direct ancestors at twenty million. Did you have any feeling at that time that uh, your subsequent work, uh, have any feeling at that time that man would go so far back into history as I, you have proven he has? I just didn't know. I'd been taught at Cambridge and I'd been taught in London that we wouldn't find man much older than a million years. And I didn't really feel terribly strong that we'd find men. But equally, I had believed my teacher, Professor Arthur Keith, who always said the separation of man from the apes must go back at least to what was then called the Oligocene. We didn't know how long ago the Oligocene was. But he said that if the cats and the dogs separated in the Oligocene, if the antelopes separated from the deer in the Oligocene, then man separated from the apes in the Oligocene too. And uh, therefore, from that extent, I certainly expected to find that the early stages would be very far back. And in Africa, as Darwin said so. When did uh, uh, you first begin to uh, uh, get evidence that these hopes were going to be fulfilled with respect to your discoveries? Uh, the first really big discoveries were 1931. In 1931, we got a, a fragment of a human jaw. We stated back to about over a million, and we got that was the Canem jaw. And we got some fragments of what we eventually called proconsul, some primitive apes that went back to 20, 25 million. Mm -hmm. But they were both very fragmentary and they were not accepted. But I accepted them even then. What does it take to be accepted? Gradually convincing your critics and, your, and the skeptics that in point of fact you're right and they're wrong. And you're all skeptics, aren't you? We're all skeptics of each other, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but one has to, the thing is, so many people confuse facts with theories. And I've always tried from the very beginning to say my facts are so and so and so and so. And then I elaborate my theories. And very often they, they reject my facts as well. And my facts are still facts. Now, in your early discoveries, I suppose much of this was rejected, was it not? Oh, from time to time, a part of the. I was never rejected in total. But again and again, some people rejected it. They just couldn't take any new ideas. Why should they? And the new ideas were the location of man's origins in Africa, as well as the... Man's origin in Africa, a much earlier date in Africa. New ideas also about man in America, which they didn't like at all. Even in 1929, I was saying that man would be here much earlier than he was thought to be. Uh, I was a rebel. You've referred often in your writings to Leakey's luck. Is there very much luck associated with what you've done? Uh, I very seldom refer to Leakey's luck myself. Others uh, do. Others have referred to Leakey's luck again and again and again. Uh, there is an element of luck, yes. Uh, it is not entirely luck. It is... Uh, well, we'll put it this way. The brain is a computer. It's the most magnificent computer that ever was. And you assess things, not only that you see consciously, especially if you've been taught to be very, very uh, observant and perceptive. You, a number of things go into your brain without consciously saying, I must think about that. And you build up a picture. And again and again, when we've said, well, we had tremendous luck in finding that particular specimen, I'm certain it's much more than that. It is a, a total assessment of an overall vast number of different tiny little pictures which build up a certainty that this is the right place to go. Well, we call it luck. When you took over from uh, the German who had preceded you, the Olduvai Gorge, which is, what, 25 miles long? 25 miles long. And a, kind of a miniature Grand Canyon. Yes. How, when you have that kind of territory to work, how do you know where to begin? Uh, by looking. Hard, hard, hard. People don't realize that when I went to Olduvai in 31, I spent from 31 to 51 only prospecting. We didn't start digging until 52. We started prospecting 20? 20 years of solid prospecting, during which we pinpointed 46 sites in this 35-mile gorge and did not dig them except small trial trenches just to verify what we'd done. I only f we didn't do our first big dig until 20 years after we started prospecting it. It's patience. 
Indeed, it is patience. Does it ever give you the feeling that you wanted to quit when you take a look at this? this never, never, story? never. There's always the feeling that just around the corner there's something better. That's why I, I wouldn't... We found important sites in 31, in 32, in 35, and I said, no... You knew it was there. I knew they were there. I mean, we found them, we located them. I knew they had to be there. When we dig them, we'd get work. But always down the corner, there might be something better still. So I said, first of all, we prospect every single piece of this gorge. Then we come back and start digging. Why was the Old Divide Gorge such a rich uh, area for digging? Uh, all right, that's a very important question indeed. To have a site that is really valuable from my point of view, there have got to be three particular things at the relevant time. Today it's dry. But at the time that I was interested in, the early part of the Pleistocene, as we call it, there had been water there, there had been lakes. That's important. Because there were lakes, there'd been animals there. We knew that because the Germans had found fossil animals. And there was ample quantities of suitable stone for making stone tools. Unless you've got the concomitation of stone for making tools, wild animals to be hunted, uh, and water, early man couldn't be there. But on top of that, the conditions for preservation were very good. We had volcanic soils full of minerals, and anything that was there would have been preserved. And on the fifth thing, the gorge itself would cut right through. Instead of having to go down this way 300 feet, we could go in this way. and it's always Like a cross-section of... Uh, we had a cross-section. Mm -hmm. And it's always cheaper to go into the cliff than it is to come down from above. Mm -hmm. And you can see things better. Mm -hmm. So we had, there were five prerequisites at Holloway Gorge. I went there simply because my German colleagues said, we don't want to go there anymore. They said, there's nothing more to do. I said, there has to be more to do if you've got water at the relevant time, stones, animals... And now you've got exposures, that is where I'm going. Now, even though you're, in America at least, probably best known among laypersons for your work in Old Divide Gorge, you worked and are working elsewhere, not only in East Africa, oh. but in other places in the world, something which came as a surprise to me. But what, what has East Africa yielded to you in terms of the story of man's beginning? Well, uh, we've never found a missing link, because a missing link doesn't exist. We've found about 10 of the missing pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. We have Proconsul, Kenya Pithecus, uh, Homo habilis, Syngantopus, Homo erectus, um, a new Oreopithecus, a lot of um, uh, Limnopithecus specimens, a uh, new dry I'm afraid that doesn't mean very much all to right, me. I'll, I'll come back. I just, you asked me a question. Well, all of these are, are key pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Some of them are fossil apes. Some of them are fossil men. Some of them are proto-men. For example, this jaw of your and my ancestor 20 million years ago. That's from 20 million years 20 ago? 20 million. That's from Rusinga Island. And it was subsequently covered by more than 1,000 feet of rock and then uncovered again by erosion. We didn't go down a thousand feet, but that had had a thousand feet of rock on top of it, and then removed again. And that is your and my answer to twenty million. We've now carried the story of Proto Man to twenty million, another side at fourteen million, another side at four million, and then two million. Well, the story is gradually. These dark are turning. Proto Man. These yeah, are this, not this man. Is, this is Proto Man. It's not an ape at all. There was an ape size. There was a contemporary ape. There were three different contemporary apes. There was a Limnopithecus, which is a gibbon, the yeah. gibbons today in India in the Far East. But we have gibbons side by side with this, real gibbons. We have proto-gorillas, we have proto-chimpanzees, and we have pro -consuls. We have four different things side by side with this. I see. But this is, this is your, your and my ancestor. What about man himself? Well, the earliest man we've got any quantity, any good specimens of, is our all the way Homo habilis, who is definitely heading towards you and me, and we've got parts of one, two, six individuals now. Now, Homo habilis is two million years. Approximately, approximately two million. But we've now got there some fragments of teeth, a few odd, oddments of Homo habilis found by my colleague Clark Howell and by my son much earlier still. We're now getting evidence of Homo habilis back at four million. The so things are moving. Yes, indeed. And before your discoveries, where was the uh, earliest... Uh, point at which man could be identified in his... Before we started on this in East Africa, the earliest true man was four to, four to five hundred thousand. So you pushed it back a million and a half oh, or much more? Much, much more. I mean, we, we, got, we got definitely a true man in this homo habilis specimens of three and a half million now. Mm -hmm. And ancestors much older than that. 
Do you think Olduvai Gorge, for example, will yield up still more evidence? Oh, yes. I told you we had we pinpointed four to six sites and we've dug 15. We, my wife is there now and she's getting new information at this minute, and this, and this last few months. Well, I've been over here. There's is more. it exciting, personally exciting, when oh, you... Oh, of course it is. I mean, but the fact is, there's no one point of it. I mean, it's excitement all the time. Uh, every moment, you know, just around the corner, there's something new coming. You've just got one excitement over, another one comes. And your stoicism doesn't stand in the way of your own personal excitement, apparently. Uh, stoicism is against feeling pain, not I against see. excitement. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Given the excitement that it seems to have for you, are enough young people taking up anthropology, archaeology, to carry on this kind of work? The vast numbers are taking it up, and they're they are very welcome. We're getting more and more good students all the time, all over the place. The biggest problem is not students, there are plenty of students wanting to learn. Uh, it's the money to train them and the money to give them field experience. This, this shocked me. Uh, in Robert Ardrey's book, African Genesis, he makes some mention of the fact that the production of his book probably involved more money than your research did. I think almost certainly. Why is it difficult for you to find money to, to do research in the origins of man? Because of until recently, there has been no single place you could go to for money for this. I raised money from 17 different foundations and other sources to cover the various projects that I cover in India, in Israel, in Africa, in Ethiopia, in this country. How much money are you talking about? Well, last year I used $350,000. 350000 yes. from 17 sources? That's right. And now we're going to try and get it uh, in a more centralized form. We're setting up a thing called the Leakey Foundation for Research in Early Men. If only I can get people to contribute to it. Instead of having to go around begging for three months a year and neglecting my research. And we, you do spend three months a year raising money? I spent three months last year, four months the year before. And it's simply fantastic. But I have to get the money. Now, I've learned better than to imagine you on your hands and knees 12 months of the year with a camel's hair brush. You do a good deal of research in your, uh, your, your curator of the Mu National Museum no, in Nairobi. I'm not now. You're not now. I was curator of the National Museum until 1962. My son is now director of the museum. I'm now director of the research department, which is behind the museum. And at least three or four months of the year, I've got a research team there of 27 people. But I direct them, and I, I, I control them. And I always have to raise money for them. Uh, and that is where a part of my time... I spend my time now partly raising money, partly in the field, and partly directing the research and writing, because you've got to write, you've got to make the reports. And all of these cost, cost money. What do you regard as the most significant discovery you've made? Is it unfair to ask you uh, to rank there them? There's no possible answer to that, because each one, and it's, if you've got a jigsaw puzzle, and you've done jigsaw puzzles, you've got the four corners maybe, and you've got some of the outside pieces where you've got the flat line, so you can't be, it must be on the edge. When you go into the middle, it's complicated. And each time you find a key piece, that is the most important piece you've had up till then. Then next time you have another key piece, it's more important still. And there's no one thing that's a base. Pro Consul in 48 was vital. Canaan was vital. Canjera was vital. They're all, all, all very important. There's no one that is higher than the others. And so many more pieces yet to go. Oh, more than 80% more than missing still. 80%? At least, yes. We, we have a complete gap between 20 million and 14 million. We've got a gap between 12 million and 4 million. We've got gaps galore. They've all got to be filled. They will be filled. Is it at all frustrating to you to realize how relatively little time each of us has given on Earth to, uh, to uncover all of this? Uh, yes and no. I, I, could, I would like to have 72 hours a day, and I'd like to live 150 years. Uh -huh. But I've got my family coming on after me to... Work, work in my place, and as long as I've done my share of it, I'm very happy. And your family is involved in your work. This my, is... my, my, Richard, Richard and his wife are with us completely now, the whole time, and all the other members of our family work part-time. And of course, I have a huge staff. But the working with your family must have been, at least from uh, another person's point of view, an unusual experience in itself. Uh, with the dangers involved, the excitement, and so forth. I wonder. Do you think so? I think Why? so. Well, just the dangers that you've shared, for example, in the open together, and the way in which the youngsters have been brought up. But you see, one doesn't look at one of them as dangers. I mean, people think that because lions walk through the camp, it's dangerous, or because there are snakes... It's not. No, lions sniff at you and go on. They don't want to eat you. 
Uh, if you leave animals alone, animals leave you alone. There are snakes come through the camp, there are lions, rhinos walk through the camp occasionally, but it's not dangerous. We never think in terms of danger. I'm afraid I can't think of it as a normal childhood. <laughs> Thank you so very much for being with us, Dr. Leakey, and we all wish you uh, continued success. Thank you. Because it's important to all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit organization created in 1968 in honor of Louis Leakey with a mission to fund human origins research and share discoveries. This season of Origin Stories was made possible by support from Dixon Long, Camilla Smith, Jeannie Newman, and donors like you. As we wrap up our From the Archive series, I want to say a special thank you to Leakey Foundation trustee Nina Carroll for funding the digitization of our audiovisual archive. Thanks to our executive director, Cheryl Camisa, for leading the archive project, and to Janine Marquez for managing it. Thanks as well to our wonderful archive volunteers, Carol Broderick, Dandy Doherty, Celia Harger, Yuka Oiwa, Joe Rogers, and Brandon Upchurch. We literally could not do this without you. And thanks so much to everyone who contributed to the success of our Origin Stories fundraising challenge. We're so grateful. Thanks to your generous contributions, we've brought on Catherine Gerardot, who's joined our team as senior producer. We have a new matching challenge in honor of Louis Leakey's birthday, all donations given in the month of August, up to a total of $5,000, will be matched four to one by Leaky Foundation fellow Mike Smith and two anonymous supporters. So please donate today. Support this show and the science we talk about by giving to the Leaky Foundation, and every donation will be quadrupled. Your $5 becomes $20, your $10 becomes $40, and if you gave $50, it would become $200 to support Louis Leakey's amazing legacy of funding research and science outreach. Go to leakeyfoundation.org slash donate. This episode was produced by me, Meredith Johnson. Our theme music is by Henry Nagel. We'll be back next month with a brand new story. Thanks for listening.